Okay, we are uh, recording now. Uh, once again, we're trying on Facebook Live. Last week, we had a technology glitch and the internet went down. We trust that Bell has gotten their act together after there was an attempted cyber attack. I understand that that's been the, the problem that they've been having lately. So let's hope this goes through. We are going to, uh, we're studying our Kuzari and Parsha she were this morning. Uh, we do so for Rafua Shalema, for Rachel Yuta Bas Rachalea. May she have a Rafua Shalema. Okay, so um, we are studying some of the principles of prophecy. And in, uh, in the Kuzari, the fourth essay, um, and what we're up to now is the fact that Nevi'im see actual visions of images in their prophecy. The, in, uh, on page 411 in the Kuzari, we had learned in subparagraph 37 that when the prophet sees with his internal eye the purest of images, which is the image of a king or a judge sitting on a throne of judgment, so then he knows that he's seeing an image of God. Um, when he sees, let's say, uh, a servant, um, a minister of the king, so then he knows he's having an image of an angel in his uh, in his prophecy. And of course, uh, Mrs. Sachachevsi asked the question, like, why do we need to know about these sort of um, minutia about prophets? That's a legitimate question, but something that I think is much more relevant today. I'm going to uh, mute everybody so that we don't get any of the feedback. Um, uh, I think one of the relevant things that we're going to see today is the fact that when God wishes to reveal himself to human beings, um, as we mentioned last week, we don't possess prophecy in our modern world anymore. And that could be for a number of reasons. It's, uh, the Talmud says that when the temple was destroyed, prophecy was taken away from lucid thinking people and given to um, idiots and children. Uh, so if you, I, I, was, I was kidding around. One of my colleagues uh, yesterday sent me uh, a copy of a text that he got from somebody who told him that he should do something in order to get his olam haba. And he, he declined the kind invitation of that individual to do that. Um, and the fellow said, well, I was just doing it to help you get olam haba. If you don't want it, I understand. So I, I remarked to him that um, from the time that the temple was destroyed, prophecy was taken from normal people and given to idiots. Um, and anyone who claims to know what, how and when and, and under what circumstances you're going to get olam haba, it certainly falls in that category. Um, so, so why is that? Um, I, I'd like to take a rational view on this, and that is that human beings have changed, have evolved, I guess you could say, although it's not clear whether this is evolving in a positive way or evolving in a negative way, but human beings have evolved to view the world in much more concrete, um, rational uh, ways. We no longer see magic in the manifestations of our world. And it's much harder for us to comprehend a, um, a world that has no veil between the natural and the supernatural. And, and as such, we no longer have an appreciation for the temple because the temple is a place where when you go there, you're supposed to perceive much more than bricks and mortar um, and a fire and an altar that is built by men. Um, the original intent was to be able to be enveloped in a, in a metaphysical experience that the people who would come to the temple would, would see that the physical trappings of the temple were merely a representation of something metaphysical that was taking place. And as human beings developed, as civilization developed, we started to divest this sixth sense that Rebbe Yehuda Levi was talking about in the previous section. And we tend to see the world in much more concrete physical terms. And so people lost their appreciation for the temple. It's the same thing that 
causes human beings to have to no longer be able to prophesy because in order to be able to prophesy you have to be able to uh, feel that there's no separation between this world and the dimension of uh, of the divine and it's very hard for people to get their heads around that today and that's why i see that's what i think that our sages are doing when they're correlating uh, the the lack of a temple with the cessation of prophecy but be that as it may there is still the ability for human beings to have near prophetic experiences. And the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato of the 18th century, talks about this in his Sefer Derech Hashem, that even though there may no longer be prophecy, there is what we call Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, where a person can have sparks of images in his mind that are not real prophecies, but moments of inspiration where, you, where you're able to sort of peel back the veil, even if just for a split second, and have an image of something that transcends the, the five senses. And so that may be one of the reasons why this discussion is relevant, so that we do have an appreciation for the fact that, that there is a continuum between this world and the spiritual dimension. And that it's not, it, it, we should not be so naive to think that all the, that the, the, those people are called uh, naturalists. A naturalist is a person, and I'm reading a book about that now, a naturalist is a person who believes that the only things that exist are things that we perceive with our senses. And it's on that basis that we try to come up with scientific theories for all that is, because, we, because science is the study of that which is. But really more accurately from our perspective, science is a study of that which we perceive to exist, not all that is, because we don't know all that is. We're not aware of all that is, right? Uh, okay, so with that in mind, the next part of this discussion is to talk about how human beings perceive God. If a prophet has a navua, if a prophet has a prophecy of God in the form of a human being, whether it's an old man, or whether it's a king, or whether it's a warrior. Those are the different images that our prophets are depicted as, uh, uh, as having images of Hashem. And of course, um, the, um, the difficulty for us is, and Rav Dessler talks about it in one of his essays, how do you pray to a God who's completely amorphous? If I were to tell you that you know, uh, when we are supposed to conceive of God, we have to conceive of him without having any physical attributes whatsoever. Um, how do we do that? I think it's sort of instinctive that from the time that we're children, we think of God as the old man in the cloud. And how, and then you learn, no, that's a mistake. God is no, not an old man in a cloud. God has no body, God has no beard. God has no face, and you're not supposed to be thinking of any human uh, image when you're praying. It's almost like uh, it's, it's very, very difficult for the human mind to be able to do that. For example, if I tell you, do not think of a polar bear, what's the first thing that happens? You're thinking of a polar bear. But I tell you, the rule of this class is you may not think of a polar bear, right? It's impossible to not think of a polar bear. Immediately you do, you conjure up that image. When we think about God, those of us who may be a little bit older may have conditioned ourselves to no longer think about God in human terms, but it's very, very difficult. It's, we, we invariably anthropomorphize God to make him more accessible. And so that's really part of the issue is that even prophets have prophetic images of God as a human being. So if even a prophet is given that image, then how, then how do we expect normal mortal beings to not think of God in human terms? And so that's really part of our discussion today is how do we reconcile the fact that we affirm that God is completely incorporeal, has no body whatsoever, and at the same time, prophets are given images of God as, as, human, as a human being. So that's really our next section. And, uh, and so it's at the bottom of uh, 
page 411, paragraph 38. So Rabbi Huda Levi writes, do not be disturbed by the fact that God is perceived in the form of a man. From the perspective of the intellect, God is perceived initially as light, for light is the most highly regarded and most ethereal of all perceived entities. What do you mean, what do you think he means when he says that from the perspective of the intellect? You know, I never understood what this meant until I studied the Morinavuchim. Never understood what the Rebbe Huda Halevi meant here. You know, um, in, in the medieval and all certainly the ancient world, the human mind was perceived as being made up of different uh, compartments, different parts. Your mind is not just a, a brain. Your mind is made up of, and even in modern science, your brain is not just a brain. There's the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, um, all of these different parts of your brain, which are responsible for different types of processing of information. So in the medieval world, the brain was known to have different faculties, different kohot. And so one of the faculties of the brain is the rational faculty, what we call the intellect. And the intellect does not conjure up images. It processes abstract ideas. And usually what happens with an enlightened individual is that those abstract ideas transfer over to another faculty of the mind called the imagination faculty. And that's the part of the mind that conjures images to associate those images with abstract ideas. So that's what I think he's saying, is that from the first day, um, using the rational faculty or the uh, intellect faculty, God is perceived initially as light, for light is the most highly regarded and most ethereal of all perceived entities. More than anything else, it surrounds and encompasses all aspects of the universe. So if we were to describe God in terms of light, um, I am the light. Where is that from? Um, I am the. That's from Christianity, I think, right? Right. You know, someone Google that. Where does that come from? Doesn't mean it's wrong just because it's got a Christian source. It just means you know, but um, but that's certainly that's certainly something that Rabbi Huda Levi is echoing. He's basically saying that the human being perceives God even in the abstract as light because light is completely amorphous, it's energy, it's all encompassing, um, and, uh, and it, 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 it permeates the entire universe as something positive that is perceived as welcome to the human being. It's, it's the source of life, um, you know, energy and so forth, yeah. Well, why? Well, uh, you know, there are many ancient religions who deify human beings, um, make human beings into into gods. In other words, the idea is like Voltaire said. If, if God made man in his image, man returned the favor. You know, as man makes God in his image. And that's generally the way human beings are able to reconcile themselves with a higher power is to deify those forms that they are familiar with. So, uh, but that's exactly what the Torah commands us not to do. The Torah says, do not deify physical objects. Even, even human beings, you cannot deify, right? Yeah, Karen. Right. Well, God is not light, let, and God is not energy. Let's be very clear. What we're talking about is how the human mind would would perceive God. And the human mind will perceive God in ways that the human mind can process the idea of God. Because we live with confined within a universe that has only a limited number of things that we can use to associate with God, right? You know, if, um, 
if, if uh, uh, when a little child plays with their toys and they wanna pretend that they're talking into the microphone and they're a rock singer, so they don't have a microphone. So what do they do? They pick up a, a wooden block that looks like a microphone or a spoon or something like that. And they start singing into the spoon. So the child knows that the spoon is not a microphone, but they're using something that most resembles the, the thing that they would like to, to imagine. So that's what we do with God. Well, that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about prophecy. And the question is that we're going, that we're actually addressing now is how is it that prophets perceive God in human form? That's exactly what we're dealing with now, precisely, including Yechezkel. Okay, so, but when we consider God's undeniable attributes, be they figurative or actual, and, and here I am the light. Oh, thank you, Miriam. Okay, Miriam has given us the reference, I am the light is in the book of John, chapter eight. So I don't know why I pulled that out of my memory. I have no idea where that comes from because um, I have not, I, I am by no means a New Testament scholar, but um, it's there somewhere in my head, probably from some TV show. I am the light of the world. Okay, thank you very much. So it's not an inaccurate statement to say that God is the light of the world, but it's merely a metaphor, right? We understand that it's a metaphor. The higher level of intellect of the human mind, which is able to process abstract ideas, would still only be able to analogize God to light, something that is within the human purview. But when we consider God's undeniable attributes, be they figurative or actual, what does he mean figurative or actual? Well, this is a whole debate among the medievalists which Rabbi Huda Halevi basically says, I'm going to skirt around. The Rambam is of the opinion, and the Rambam, you know, lives after Rabbi Huda Halevi. They, their lives intersect for only a few years, for about five years. The Rabbi Huda Halevi dies in 1140, and the Rambam is born in 1135. So uh, the Rambam was about five years old when Rabbi Huda Halevi passed away. So the Rabbi Huda Halevi is not influenced by the Rambam but the Rambam may be influenced by Rabbi Huda Levi, it's unclear. But one thing we do know that the Rambam, when he talks about God and uh, talking about God's attributes, he's not speaking in a vacuum. He didn't invent this conversation. And that's why Rabbi Huda Levi is able to engage in this conversation as well. In the Islamic world, especially, there is this huge debate as to whether God actually has attributes or not. Can you say that God is good, kind, benevolent, et cetera? Or are these only um, human terminologies that we assign to a God that we truly don't understand because God is so transcendent that he is devoid of any attributes that we can associate with human characteristics. So this is the big debate. The Rambam's position is that you can only describe God in terms of negative attributes. You can only say what God is not. You cannot say what God is, because to suggest that God has attributes uh, it implies that he is not completely unitary, because there is God plus his attributes. And those attributes are sort of like supplements to the unitariness of God. And therefore, if anyone who is made up of multiple attributes cannot be truly unitary. So therefore, we cannot ascribe real attributes to God. We can only say that God is not dead. He is not evil. He is not, right? We cannot say really what God is. So therefore, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says, look, that's complex. That's a difficult discussion. It's not something that we're going to get into now. We're not going to talk, we're not going to debate the issue, whether the attributes that we identify with God are real or figurative. So he is referred to as living capable, knowing, desirous, organizing, giving to each thing its appropriate due, a true judge, and so on. But we will not find any closer analogy among things we perceive than the speaking spirit that is the complete human being. In other words, if we wanted to say, what is the closest creature that most closely resembles God within all of creation? It would not be light because light is inanimate 
and light is not sentient, doesn't have any consciousness. What being most closely resembles God among all of the things that exist within our purview? The answer is the human being. The human being is the closest thing within our realm of perception that resembles God. And that's the reason why prophets perceive God in their prophetic images as a human being. Because it's Salam Elohim. That's right. And we'll get to that in just a second. Note, however, that the analogy refers to the person's humanity. The analogy does not apply to his body, for a physical body is as common to him as it is to plants. The thing that makes me human is not that I have skin and bones, because animals and even plants have skin and bones to a sense, in a sense. Nor does the analogy relate to the fact that he is alive, for life is as common to him as it is to animals. So the fact that I'm alive is also not something that makes me analogous to God because animals are also alive. So what is it about me as a human being that makes me most analogous to God? It is my humanity. What do we mean by my humanity? What is it that distinguishes me from a, a, an animal? Our souls, our, our, what we would call our consciousness. Yeah, we could call it our souls, absolutely. Philosophers have dubbed the universe the great man and have also dubbed man the small universe meaning that man represents a microcosm of everything that exists in the larger universe. If so, and God is the spirit, soul, intellect, and life force of this universe, he is called life of the universe in the book of Daniel, then we can appreciate the analogy even on an intellectual basis. Almost sounds like a pantheistic um, um, idea that God is the soul of the universe. Well, just like the universe is comprised of a body, that is all of the planets, the stars, and everything that we see, God is the soul that gives rise to this existence. So too, my humanity, the soul, like Annette is saying, is the thing that makes me most analogous to God. And then he says, an even greater reason, though, for us to appreciate the analogy between man and God is, the, is because the prophets saw this analogy in their visions and prophecy is a higher level of understanding than logic. In other words, while it may be difficult for us, perhaps intellectually, to appreciate this idea that God can be analogized to human beings, um, the fact that prophets actually saw God in a vision in the shape of a, and form of a human being means that that's the way God wishes for himself to be perceived. This lofty community was an eyewitness to this vision. Moreover, they saw the heavenly hosts, spiritual beings who are close to God in the form of a man. God alluded to them when he said, let us make man in our image as our likeness. God was saying, I have established the hierarchy of creation with wisdom. From the elements, I first created minerals, then plants, then living creatures in the air and water, and then living creatures on the land who possess heightened senses and remarkable instincts. There is no level higher than the level approaching the divine angelic. This is the level which man occupies. He was created in the image of God's angels and ministers who are close to him. By close, we mean close to his level, not physically close, as God is not confined by space. And so there's so many um, um, undertones of ideas that Maimonides picks up on in the first section of Morena Buchim. It's almost as if the Rabbi Huda Halevi in these last few paragraphs is paving the road for an expansion of these ideas, which is what the Rambam does in the first section of Moren Evuchim. But just to give you just an illustration of what we're talking about, how the human being is the closest to God and his angels, um, we'll just take a quick look at, um, at the first, the very first paragraph of Moren Avuchim, the very first uh, chapter of Moren Avuchim. Here he, again, he talks about the idea of Naase Adam Bitsalmenu Kidmutenu. Let us make man in our image as our likeness. Some have been of the opinion, I'm just reading from the Moren Avuchim, I hope you can all see it. Some have been of the opinion that by the Hebrew word Selem, 
the shape and figure of a thing is to be understood. And this led men to believe in the corporeality of God. They, when they read this verse, let us make man in our image, people concluded, oh, that must mean that God must have a human body. He must have a physical body. For they thought that the words, let us make man in our tselem, implied that God had the form of a human being, namely that he had a figure and shape, and that consequently he was corporeal. They adhered faithfully to this view and thought that if they were to relinquish it, they would ipso facto or eo ipso, not sure what that Latin term means, or by definition, reject the truth of the Bible. And further, if they did not conceive God as having a body possessed of face and limbs, similar to their own in appearance, they would have to deny even the existence of God. This, of course, is a very primitive way of thinking, but it is the way ancient man viewed the biblical passage. And, um, and the, the Rambam's point is, this is all a mistake. The sole difference which they admitted was that he excelled in greatness and splendor and that his substance was not flesh and blood. But he was still corporeal in the sense that he had a body. It might be a much more ethereal body, but it's a body nonetheless. Thus far went their conception, conception of the greatness and glory of God. The incorporeality of the divine being and his unity in the true sense of the word, for there is no real unity without incorporeality, will be fully proved in the course of the present treaties. And that's really what the Rambam devotes the very beginning of the, the second part of Moranabuchim to. So we're skipping a little bit, and he says the term tselem does not mean what early people believed. It does not mean that God says, let me make man in the same physical image that I have, but it rather re signifies the specific form. The word form is being used by the Rambam in, in a very, very formal way. The word form is in contradistinction to matter using Aristotelian terminology, that everything is a dichotomy of matter and form in this world, namely that which constitutes the essence of a thing whereby the thing is what it is, the reality of a thing insofar as it is that particular being. What makes me a human being and not an animal? So it's my soul, it's my consciousness. In man, the form is that constituent which gives him human perception. And on account of this intellectual perception, the term selim is employed in the sentences, b'tselem elohim bara oto. God created him in his image. It is therefore rightly said, thou despisest their tselem. In Psalms, referring to you despise the image of idolatry. The contempt can only concern the soul, the specific form of man, not the properties and shape of his body. I am also of the opinion that the reason why this term is used for idols may be found in the circumstance that they are worshipped on account of some idea represented by them not an account of their figure and shape. For the same reason is the term, the term is used in the expression, salme, the forms of your emirates, for the chief object was the removal of the injury caused by the emirates, not a change of their shape. Here he's referring to an idolatry that was made in the shape of hemorrhoids, which we're not gonna go into now, but the point being is that the, the shape itself was not offensive, but it was what it represented. As man's distinction consists in a property with no, which no other creature on earth possesses, namely intellectual perception or consciousness or soul, however you want to describe it, in the exercise of which he does not employ his senses nor move his hand or his foot, meaning it's a cogito, cogito ergo sum, right? This perception has been compared, though only apparently not in truth, to the divine perception, which requires no corporeal organ account, that is on account of the divine intellect with which man has been endowed, he is said to have been made in the form and likeness of the Almighty. But far from it be the notion that the Supreme Being is corporeal, having any material form. That's just the first chapter, and I cut out a whole, about, about half of the chapter, but that's the first chapter of Moranavuchim. It sort of establishes that no one should ever think that any kind of analogy between God and man is because God has any corporeality, any physicality attributable to him. And that's exactly what Rebbe Yehuda here, Halevi here is laying down. But 
but he's coming at it from the opposite direction. The fact that prophets have prophecies of God in the form of a human being is not to suggest that God has that form, but rather it simply means that whatever we see in ourselves that makes us human, whatever we see in kings that makes them a king, it's not the crown and it's not the red carpet, but it's the kingship of that person. That's what is being attributed to God in the vision of the prophet. And human beings are ruled by their imagination. We am, and, and so is it, you know, ultimately the question therefore is, am I committing a terrible avera, a terrible sin, if I, when I'm davening, I envision God as a man in a cloud? And the answer would be, no, as long as you appreciate that it's your imagination playing tricks on you. That's not God. That's a representation of God that my limited human intellect um, is capable of sort of envisioning. But I'm not, that's not an Avera, right? If that's what you, if that's what you see when you close your eyes, you should try to blur that vision as much as you can, recognizing that God has no body. But if that's the only way that you can focus your attention is the guy with the white robes, with the long white beard and, uh, and, and sitting on a cloud, okay, as long as you recognize that that's just a representation, it's not real. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I mean, another way of phrasing that is, you know, this, um, this tension that you're discussing is a tension that's been discussed by religious philosophers for centuries, which is imminence versus transcendence. And there's how do you we want to make God a personal God. We want to make God someone who, someone who is imminent, present in our lives, attentive, a loving parent, a stern parent at times, someone who is completely mindful of everything that I am doing, right? So it's like God is right here on my shoulder watching everything that I'm doing. That's a very small God, right? And then yet I'm supposed to, at the same time, balance the transcendence of this all-powerful being who is um, as much in the farthest reaches of the universe that the Hubble telescope hasn't even been able to capture in an image um, as much as he is here. And that God far transcends anything that we can imagine in our minds and, uh, um, and uh, both conceptually and spatially, God does not even occupy space, right? So how do we reconcile the two? And the answer is, is that they're not reconcilable. They're not. And that's part of the mystery of the divine, is that God tells us, in my true nature, you're, no one can... There is nothing that you can analogize me to is ultimately what the prophet says. There is no way that I can be compared to anything with any level of accuracy. But I still want you to find some way of connecting to that which is completely transcendent and unreachable, unreachable and unfathomable. So in order, because I want you to have feel that we have a relationship, use whatever devices that are not idolatry that are within your grasp to be able to do that. So build a temple and, and conjure the image that I am occupying the temple. Because I, and I will even create a cloud that will represent my presence in, that will rest on in between the two Keruvim in the temple. I'll help you is basically what God is saying. I want you to perceive of me as an imminent God um, being there right there in front of you. But at the same time, uh, acknowledge and recognize that it is only a um, an analogy. It's not real. Yeah. Follow up clarification. Yeah. So therefore, as opposed to everything else in our lives, where we can say our rational mind can comprehend it if we put in enough effort and have enough information, we are actually being directed to say 
you can never comprehend me, but don't stop trying. And so therefore, know that every time you come to something you think is true, keep it and start again. That, that's what I'm hearing you say. Is that true? Yeah, you will never, you will never comprehend me, um, right. no matter how hard you try. It's there are certain things. It's the way that I, the, the analogy that I use, I've always used, is you know the old calculators. Um, you know, they only may have, originally they had only eight digits, now they have like 10 digits or a dozen digits. But if you try to take a 10 digit number and you multiply it by another 10 digit number, you will get an E instead of the real number. Because the, the, the calculator is basically telling you, I'm out of space. I don't have the capacity to calculate that number, okay? Our minds are calculators, our minds are, were created by God with certain limitations that no human being is capable of transcending, okay? The, the one human being that had the greatest ability to transcend the human limitations of the limitations of the human mind was Moshe Rabbeinu by special divine grace. And, but we are told that that was sui generis and it will never happen before and it will never happen again. Any other person who has a conception of the divine is limited by the experiences and the, the, um, the, the bits and bytes and the, uh, the data that the mind is able to process. We're just a very sophisticated computer system that has its limitations. Sometimes people can be so traumatized that even though um, they were brought up their entire life with a certain belief and a, and a narrative about about God, the trauma it doesn't allow them to continue believing in that in that kind of God. And we don't we don't judge those people. No. Yeah. Okay. So let us go now. Go on to the parsha. Uh, we'll uh, we've closed the kuzari. Let's let us move on. Okay. The title of our Devar Torah today. I hope everyone can see the screen. Is finding our own straw. Now, um, everything every story in the Torah has a purpose, and we know that at the end of Parsha Shemos. Um, we're well into the story. We're skipping over all of the earlier parts of the story of Mo baby Moshe and, uh, and his rise to greatness, his travels to Midian, his uh, conversation with God in chapter four. We now go to the final chapter of Parshat Shemot, which is chapter five, and we discover something very interesting. We find that after Moshe has been dispatched to tell Paro to let the Jewish people go, Paro doubles down and says, nothing doing, Moshe. And as a result of Moshe and Aaron coming to, to Paro, Torah tells us, Paro commanded the taskmasters and the officers as follows. Lo tosifun latet teven laam lilbon halevenim kitmol shilshom. You shall no longer give straw to the people to enable them to manufacture bricks. From now on, when the Jews are told that they have a quota of bricks that they need to manufacture, they have to go out and find the straw themselves. Now, why is that? So the next Pasuk in the Torah says, you may not de deduct from the standard quota, lo tigru umimenu. It's got a, this quota remains the same, even though their work is going to be multiplied because in addition to just mixing the mortar with the straw, they actually have to go out and find the straw. And why is that? Ki nir pim heim. What is the word nir pim? How would you translate anyone? Anyone want to try, make an attempt to translate the word nir pim? Nir pim. What does the word rafa mean in Hebrew? Rafa. 
That's the Shoresh, Resh Pei He. How would you translate that word? No, no, no. Rafa is means soft. It's uh, uh, it's the opposite of chazak. Opposite of strong is weak. Near pim, they're weak or they're soft. Is are two ways to translate that word. Um, and as Rashi points out, ki near pim min ha'avodahem, they're soft or weak from uh, uh, from work. In other words, they or maybe another word would be lax. They're, they're too lax from working. In other words, they're not working hard enough. And that's the reason why they're, why they're asking, because what was Moshe's request? Let us go and worship God out in the desert. We wanna go out for three days and have a festival of worship out in the desert. And that was the original request not let my people go entirely, but give us a, a, an opportunity to go and have a retreat in the desert of worship. And Paro says, you know, the only people who ask for a retreat are people who have become so uh, soft and weak in, and lost their work ethic that they think, oh, I'm a, what would you call them today? We call them snowflakes, right? You bunch of snowflakes is essentially what Paro is saying. He says, what you need coffee breaks and you need the uh, overtime and you need workers comp and you need all of these things. He says, that's not a hard worker. That's a soft worker. That's someone who doesn't appreciate what it means to put in a hard day's work. And therefore, it's so Akim lay more in Elecha. And that's why they're crying out, we need to have a retreat, right? It's because, and the truth is, you see this in, in life today also. People who are used to working, let's say, and I, I don't mean to stereotype, people who have government jobs, right? If you've ever noticed the, uh, the people who work at the border patrol, and I don't mean to discriminate against it because we actually have a member who works at the border. But if you've ever, and the thing that drives me absolutely bananas, and I hope I'm not the only person who's had this experience. If you've ever seen someone who works as a, as a border patrol person, the speed in which they arise from their seat, walk over to a back room, shuffle papers and then come back, to me strikes me as being in slow motion. In other words, if that person were working for me, I would say, excuse me, are you suffering from rheumatoid arthritis? Is there something, you're only 27 years old, why are you crawling like an old person? Why are you walking with such sloth and lack of initiative? And so there's a part of me that sympathizes with Paro. In other words, you basically, you know you're being paid by the hour. You know, regardless of how much work you do, you're going to, your day starts at a certain time and it ends when the whistle blows and you clock in and you clock out and no one is gauging you for your productivity. So you can afford to, uh, uh, to ask for more breaks and you can afford to ask for a retreat. And so Kinir Pim, you people have gotten soft and flabby and, and, and lax about, and, and you don't have the proper work ethic anymore. And that's why you're asking for a retreat. And as the Bechor Shor just elaborates, another one of the medievalists, another one of the Rishonim, Rafa Aleim Hamalacha. They no longer have a strong work ethic and an initiative to work. So the whole idea of work has become softened for them or, or um, uh, weakened for them. And they're constantly thinking, how can we get out of working? Because if the work was something that was important to them, they would not pay attention to thinking about how we can get out of working. It's not what a diligent worker is thinking of. What's my, when's my next coffee break? When's my next opportunity to break away from work, right? That's only a person who doesn't have a commitment to the work that they're doing. So Paro's point is well taken. And I want you to notice that he says the word nirpim three times in this section. Ki nirpim heim, and then later on in Pasuk Yud Zion, um, when the taskmasters, complain and they say to Paro, how 
why are you punishing us? In other words, we're the ones who are getting whipped because we're not able to keep up with the quota because of all of the work that, the new work that has been placed upon us. And Paro's response is, Vayomer near pim atem near pim. You are weak or you're soft, you're soft. Al atem, and by the way, some of the Meforshim um, say that you are soft the first time is near pim, is a description of, uh, or, or is a noun, soft ones, atem near pim. You are soft is an adjective. In other words, that's one way of looking at it. And that's why uh, you're saying, let's go offer sacrifices to God. Now, what is the fact that straw is the thing that Paro decided to deprive them of? Why specifically? And what is the message that we're supposed to draw from here? So the first thing I want to point out is that many, uh, the reason why uh, ancient bricks Brick making required straw. Is uh, this is from Wikipedia, so it's got to be true, right? He says many clay products require the addition of other materials to add strength and durability. In the case of bricks in Old Testament Egypt, river clay is usually composed of very fine particles, and so would dry slowly. Adding as would dry slowly, adding straw would open up the clay allowing it to dry more readily in the sun. In addition to aiding in drying, the linear nature of straw adds stability to the clay brick in much the same way that rebar or wire mesh reinforces modern day concrete. Bricks made without straw would break and crumble easily. So what Paro is essentially saying is that you need, you need to be responsible for the straw and you need to make sure that you strengthen the bricks yourselves. I'm not gonna strengthen the bricks for you. You've got to strengthen it yourself. Now, while this is just part of the narrative, uh, my contention, and I think we would agree, that anytime the Torah has certain aspects of the story that it highlights, there's supposed to be a moral lesson in here as well. What is the moral lesson from uh, in Paro um, accusing the Jews of being near Pim? What are we, what are you and I supposed to draw from that? I mean, they were schlepping and working and, and constantly doing the work that they were supposed to do, but was there any validity in them saying, we wanna be able to take off time to Davin Mincha? Is there anything wrong with that? It's essentially, that's what they're doing. Give us some time, we wanna have a religious retreat. We wanna go and worship God. And if, let's say, there was such a request from a group of employees who were religious, would there be anything wrong with that, right? So, so what, are, what are you and I supposed to draw from this? Is, is it just that we're supposed to deduce from here that anytime someone denies re, a request for a break for religious reasons, that person's an evil paro? Is there any legitimacy to this? So, the, the simple understanding is we can't learn anything from Paro. Paro's a bad guy. He's the evil oppressor of the Jews. And therefore you learn from here that people who are anti-God will use all different kinds of rationalizations to, uh, to suppress religious expression. Even though it may sound logical and reasonable, you're too soft, you've lost your work ethic, and that's why you want to take a break to Daven Mincha, right? That's actually a cover up for a desire to suppress religion. Unfortunately, um, many times you will find that if an Orthodox Jew works for a non Orthodox Jew, at least this was used to be the way it used to be, it, and he wants to take off for Shabbos and wants to leave on Friday afternoon to be able to take off for Shabbat, the tradition was you would get a harder time asking a Jewish employer than you would get from asking a non-Jewish employer. And the reason used to be is because the Jewish employer um, is resentful of the fact that you're an Orthodox Jew. Look at me. I can work until well after sundown on Friday because I have a good work ethic. I know what it means to be an aspiring lawyer or an accountant, and I will work even though I'm sacrificing my Sabbath, and you should be doing the same thing that's the proper work ethic. 
And that's one of the things you can learn from this story. However, and that's all well and good. And if that's the lesson that you wanna take from this discussion, very well and good. But I would suggest that there's actually something even deeper here that we can take. And this is what the Shalah, I'm gonna use as my launch pad, the Shalah HaKadosh. The Shalah says, Nirpim Atem Nirpim. Alkein Atem Omrim Nelchaniz Bechalashem, the Shalah HaKadosh from the 16th century, Rabbi Yeshaya Horowitz, Halevi. Mikan Hotzeiti Remez Musar Ba'avodat Hashem Yitbarach. I have chosen to derive from this passage a very important um, allusion to a message that I'd like to give to my, to my people in the way that we're properly supposed to serve God. He says there was a, 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 um, a prevailing practice in his time that people would try to incentivize themselves in their Torah study and in their prayers and in the doing of other mitzvot, people would incentivize themselves to say, I'm going to wake up and be on time for the early shacharis. And if I don't, if I miss it, I'm going to commit myself to give a certain penalty, pay a certain penalty to tzedakah. That's what people used to do. It's almost like what the, what do they call that? The, uh, the curse jar, right? I'm not gonna curse. And if I curse, I gotta put in a dollar into the curse jar. So people would have the penalty box that if they didn't come on time to minion, this would be a way of incentivizing themselves. And that's actually a very laudable thing, right? So he says, Shato, so the Shalah says, not so fast. He says, Shatov yoter knas. Better that you should do the mitzvah when you're supposed to than have to pay the penalty. And that's what is alluded to when Paro says, you people are weak or you people are soft. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to compensate for your failure to just offer a sacrifice to God. God is not interested in your sacrifice as a makeup for what you fail to do, sort of like a penalty makeup. God actually really just wants you to serve him properly. Don't create penalties for yourself. Just do, just do the right thing. And don't be soft. And, and what Paro is really saying is really what the Shalah says God is saying. God puts words into Paro's mouth and says, if you're weak, meaning that you're lax in doing the mitzvot, you feel you can do a makeup by bringing a korban, by bringing a sacrifice. God says, you know what? I'd rather you not do that. I'd rather you not be lax and do makeups for, the, for, for your failure to serve, but I would much rather see you just do the, the mitzvah properly. And that's the way he reads, he reads that into this message. And that in, in, in the idea using the Kabbalistic tradition, that even in the words of evil people, you can draw valuable lessons. I'd like to modify the message of the Shalah just ever so slightly so that it becomes more contemporary for all of us. But I think perhaps what we might draw from here is that there is a, there is a pitfall in being an Orthodox Jew. The pitfall in being an Orthodox Jew is that as long as I check off all the boxes of being Shomer Shabbos, Shomer Kashrus, I put on my tefillin every morning, I daven every day, um, I, I light the Shabbos candles when I'm supposed to, and I, I dress properly on Shabbos, and I show up, and I sit in my seat, and I do whatever I'm supposed to do, I fulfilled all my obligations to Hashem. And it's very easy for the individual to lose the larger picture. And the larger picture is view yourself as God's employee. And when you're God's employee, it's not about fulfilling your quota. It's not about checking off the boxes. It's about devoting yourself entirely, your entire life to a life of service to Hashem. And if you view your life as just fulfilling your quota, 
but you'd like to be able to do other things on your spare time in between all of the things that you have to do when you're after you've checked off everything on your list. So then that's a sign of nirpim atem nirpim. Alkein atem omrim nilachaniz bachalashem. In other words, if if your whole objective is let me go and bring that specific korban and just check off the box that I've done what I'm supposed to do, then you've missed the larger picture. And it's the idea of nirpim atem nirpim. You've grown weak in your attachment to Hashem. And I just want to point out in my concluding remarks that it's quite interesting that, as I mentioned, Haro uses the word nirpim three times. There are three times when Hashem says to us, I will not let you grow weak, or I will not weaken, I'll not, not allow you to become weak. They are three times in the entire Torah where the Torah says, Ki kel rachum Hashem elokecha. This is in Deuteronomy, Perak Dalid. Lo yar pecha velo yashchitecha. God will not allow you to become weak. Now, what does it mean, lo yar pecha? So it says, milahach biyadav. God will never let you go. God will never loosen his grasp of you. God is never going to loosen his attachment to you. God will not allow you to become weak, to become soft. God will not loosen himself from you so that you are left just um, disembodied or not held tightly to him. Hashem is always holding you tight to him. Hashem is always encouraging you. And uh, that's that's the thing that we have to envision is that we are constantly in Hashem's loving, tight embrace. If we view ourselves as as um, just checking off the things that we're we're supposed to do and try to wiggle out of that close embrace, then it's we who are near Pim. It's not God who is being mirafe, who is weakening us or weakening His grasp. It is we who are wiggling from away from Hashem. And it also helps us explain why Hashem created a system of mitzvot. It's supposed to be a holistic system that by going from one mitzvah to the other over the course of the day, we feel enveloped in a holistic system that completely changes our orientation and the way that we view life. If, however, that's not the way our, our life works, if we essentially are secular in our thinking, but we do the mitzvot and are not influenced intellectually, emotionally by being fully um, surrounded and embraced by the a life of, of Torah, so then clearly there's a problem. There's near pim atem near pim, and you're just looking to go from one mitzvah to the next without recognizing that it's a holistic, holistic embrace. I would also suggest that there may be a connection to another word uh, having to do with Rafa that occurs earlier in the Parsha, which is when Moshe Rabbeinu is dispatched by Hashem to go to Egypt to speak to Paro and tell him to let the people go, he stops off by Yehi Baderech Bamalon, that they stopped off at an inn, which represents taking a break, near Pimatem, near Pim. And what happens? God um, encountered Moshe and sought to destroy him, sought to kill him. In other words, what Hashem was sending Moshe the message, whatever the Midrashic explanation is, is that by taking this coffee break, you have demonstrated that this is not your high, highest priority of being, of existing. And you're involving and engaging yourself in your personal affairs when you have to be completely immersed in a life of service. And so therefore, after Tzipora performs the Brit Milah, representing the idea that life is full, uh, is a life of service that is circumcised and confined into that embrace, Vayiref Mimen, then um, there is this loosening from Moshe of that death embrace. In other words, there are two embraces that a person can try to feel embraced by. One is the embrace of Hashem in a life of Torah and mitzvot. But if not, then there's another embrace because you always have to serve somebody. You always have to uh, um, 
submit yourself to some other kind of service. So Vayireth Mimenu is that once Sipora and Moshe collaboratively recommit themselves to that life of service, then there's a loosening of the grasp of death that is trying to take away Moshe. In any event, we'll hold it here because we're over time. Let me wish you all a great rest of the week. And uh, any questions, comments before we go? Okay. Um, Elaine. Hi, I'm Elaine. Gonna... Hi, I'll put my video on. Here I am. Um, I was just thinking, not only should we consider ourselves servants to Hashem, but when we go out in the world, we have to uh, demonstrate the type of people we are, because you know, especially men with kippahs and then the women, the, the dress more, more modest dress, that we stand out and that we have to uh, be careful when, when we're with the, out in the general world that we have a good impression as servants of Hashem. Very well stated. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Bye.